Hello, welcome to another episode of Forgotten Cemeteries of Pacific Northwest. Today we're at Purden Cemetery, Purden, I think is how you say it correctly. It's located in Forest Grove, Oregon, Washington County. Alternative names include Hallsmeyer. That's the only one I could find, and coincidentally, there's no Hallsmeyers buried here that I know of. So let's go meet some of the local residents and hear their story. So, apologies right off the bat. This is, uh, well, I'm sure you can hear that car flying by. It's right next to a very loud road where everybody kind of does like 45 or 55 miles an hour out in the country and they rip around bends and um, the parking is non-existent here. I'm going to have to show you guys where the park if you visit here. Pretty unsafe, but Puritan Cemetery was established in 1862 and that's pretty much your history right there. I struggled with this cemetery and couldn't find much about it and the people buried. Um, I did find that the Puritans came to Oregon in the spring of 1854. They weren't listed on my normal pioneer list where I, I look on there and they kind of have the people that went on the wagon train and there's a reason why they're not on that list. Uh, there was an alternative way to get to Oregon during that time and we'll talk about that. Um, it is a family cemetery to the Puritans and I believe their farm used to be located out here. And we're we're kind of looking out over the valley here and we see a lot of farmland with a big hawk flying in the screen now. <laughs> okay, our first stop is Ira Ellis Puritan. I think that's how you say that first name. Ira or Ira. So he was born in Ohio in 1801. I think Cincinnati based on my readings. Um, at first he would move his family to Missouri. As mentioned, the Puritan family would arrive in Oregon April 9th, 1854. Now, I, at first I didn't see him on the Oregon Trail list that I normally refer to for, you know, the pioneers on the wagon train. In fact, I didn't really see any Puritan family on the 1854 list overall. So I did find a source that mentioned he took a steamboat from Cincinnati. Um, that trip would include traveling down the Mississippi. I'm guessing that you connect at New Orleans based on the map I found, and I'll, I'll put it on the YouTube video. Then through the Gulf of Mexico and around the Isthmus of the Panama. And then you make your way up the west coast of Oregon. This was probably a good decision by um, Ira because in 1854, this seemed to be like kind of a rough year for the Oregon Trail. Um, it included the 1854 Ward Massacre, the William Ward Train. That took place in August where for some reason wagons trains split. The Ward Train was passing through Canyon Road and Native Americans from the Shoshone and Snake Indians war parties encountered a group of 20 immigrants the ward train. One of the Native Americans would try to take one of the horses by force, but would be shot down by one of the travelers right away. This would greatly anger the Native Americans and they killed about 20 of the ward immigrant party. Um, I think I read that only like two boys survived that massacre. The U.S. Army would retaliate against the Indians. The local tribes were pretty angered by this that uh, Fort Boise and Fort Hall were soon abandoned. The Oregon Trail was unsafe at this point without a military escort until the 1862 Gold Rush. Um, there's a monument of the Ward Massacre actually located in Canyon County, Idaho as well. So back to Ira. He would land in Tualatin Valley in Oregon, uh, more specifically in the town of Greenville. He would score 640 acres of a free land claim and would have a successful career at being a judge. Here's a Deborah. Patterson Pierden, wife of Ira. She would move to Missouri at some point, then must have met Ira at one time, and then moved to Oregon in 1854 with him. She would have four children with uh, Ira, Marianne Watson, E.J. Barrett, W.W. Pierden, and Ira E. Pierden Jr. So apologies, someone decided to start weed whacking one of the neighbors, so hopefully you can hear me fine. Here we have William Whitfield Pierden, born in 1829 in Boonville, Missouri. William fought in the Yakima Indian Wars actually in 1855. There's an interesting story I came across where um, the early tensions of the Yakima Indian Wars were centered around a man named Andrew Bolin. Um, this would be from a Wikipedia source that I was reading up on. And I guess he was kind of like the whole reason the Yakima Indian War started in Oregon. So, on September 20th, 1855, the Bureau of Indian Affairs agent, Andrew Bolin, hearing of the death of the prospectors at the hands of Qualchin, I guess that's a tribe apparently, 
Um, departed for the scene on horseback to investigate, but was intercepted by Yakima Chief Shumawe, who warned Quilchen was too dangerous to confront. Heeding Shumawe's warning, Bolin turned back and began the ride home. On route, he came upon a group of Yakima traveling south and decided to just ride, ride along with them since he knew them. One of the members of this group was Moshel, Shumawe's son. Moshel decided to kill Bolin for reasons that are not entirely clear to this day. Though a number of Yakima in the traveling party protested it, their objections were overruled by Michel, who invoked his regal status. Discussions about Bolin's fate took place over much of the day. Bolin, who did not speak Yakima, was unaware of the conspiracy unfolding among his travel traveling companions. Sorry, a lot of traffic. <laughs> During a rest stop, as Bolin and the Yakima were eating lunch, Michel and at least three other Yakima set upon him with knives. Bolin yelled out in Chinook dialect, I did not come to fight you before being stabbed in the throat. Bolin's horse was then shot and his body and personal belongings were burned. Bolin's body was never recovered. Now I did come across a bit of info that claimed that one of the Indians in the riding party, that Bolin was responsible. Um, they claimed that Bolin was responsible for the hanging of several tribe members. There's actually a memorial marking the murder site and I'll try to put a link down below in the, the description of the video. So back to uh, William here. He would marry a woman named Miss L.D. Cunningham, but I didn't see her listed in the cemetery, but they would have two children together named Mary Galloway and C. Puritan. However, Miss Cunningham must have died early because he would not remarry in 1888 to a woman named Miss C.J. Brown in Shawnee Town, Illinois. Here we have Cora Puritan. Washington obituaries list her as Cara for some reason, not Cora, so it's probably a misspelling. But as you can see on her headstone, her name is Cora. She was born in 1881 and died in 1905. She was only 23 when she died, unfortunately. Um, her obituary mentioned that she was battling a lingering illness, but not specifically what it was. At the time, she had been a student at a state normal school. I guess in 1882, the legislature established normal schools in Ashland and Monmouth. It focused on preparing teachers for public and private elementary and secondary schools in Oregon. Today we know that college is Western Oregon University. Sadly, Cora wouldn't get her chance to teach and educate the youth of America. At a time in 1908 where the Ford Model T was just coming out, the Titanic would sink in 1912, and World War I would break out in 1914. And not that we need a reminder of another pandemic, but the Spanish flu was lurking around the corner and wreak havoc on the world in 1918. And here we have Perry Watson, who was born in the year 1846, and this is based off his obituary that he didn't come to Oregon until 1896. He is a Civil War vet. He served in Company K of the 1st Arkansas Infantry. One of the battles that was part of the Tohoma campaign was the Battle of the Liberty Gap. This battle would display early mounted infantry, basically using rifles on horseback instead of marching. They would specifically use Spencer repeating rifles designed by Christopher Spencer in 1860, conveniently one year before the Civil War. Interestingly enough, when Spencer put out a rifle for adoption, it was rejected by the Department of War. They said that soldiers would waste their ammunition on such a weapon. Apparently, Spencer was able to have an audience with Abraham Lincoln at one point to kind of put on a demonstration of the Spencer rifle and what it could do for him. Story goes, Lincoln was very impressed and ordered the adoption of the rifle, like, right away. Um, however, a man named James Wolfe Ripley refused, who was a Union soldier general at the time. It would be eventually used by the Navy. Um, my boss will probably like that because he was in the Navy, and I could hear him saying, that's because the Navy knows what they're doing, so... <laughs> The Confederate soldiers would get their hands on this weapon eventually, but apparently there was a copper shortage and they couldn't manufacture the cartridges, the ammunition for the weapon basically. The Confederates were just deemed to lose, outgunned and overpowered in the end with the development of the Spencer rifle. This weapon would change history as it was used against Native Americans who didn't ex expect like a second, immediate second volley of bullets. They were used to that, you know, kind of like one shot. A volley and they're like well we got a little time to attack um, they were kind of taken off surprise when a second volley came immediately all right our final story is about an individual that doesn't reside here um, it has appeared though and it's a pretty twisted story I guess you'd say 
Um, that is not their headstone on the right. That belongs to Nimrod and Mary Watson. That's their memorial. Well, let's talk about a man named Private Charles W. Pearden. Again, he's not buried here. He is buried at Riverview Cemetery. There's about 60,000 burials there. Really pretty cemetery from my understanding, but uh, it's not our style. We like these ones out in the middle of nowhere in the backwoods, right? <laughs> so Charles' story is one of the more disturbing stories I've read about in uh, Ken Bilderback's book, Law and Order at the End of the Oregon Trail. And I'll put a link to that book. It's got a lot of interesting stories about this area, like stories nobody knows about. He's a really good author. Um, so Charles was a big time war hero back in the day. He was the son of a pioneer. Um, this is named Charles W. Pearden, I believe it was his father's name. Same name, but I couldn't find his father on Find a Grave for some reason. His mother was Lucy Pearden as well, but I couldn't find anything on Find a Grave. But there is a Lucinda buried at this Pearden Cemetery. And I believe uh, Lucy is uh, short for Lucinda. We'll show during the tour. So as mentioned, Charles was a war vet of the Spanish-American War Wars. He was in Company H, the Second Oregon Volunteer Infantry. He would marry a woman named Agnes in 1913. Reading about um, them both, it felt like kind of like a volcano was meeting a tornado, as both Charles and Agnes were damaged goods from the get-go. Agnes came from a previous marriage where she lost both of her children in court to her ex-husband. Um, Charles, being a war vet, was dealing with some mental issues, most likely, and there, there wasn't a whole lot of mental help during this time. Keep in mind, this is way back then when they just said, you know, get over it, you're a man. So the soldier of the Spanish-American Wars probably saw things that they never experienced, I guess. Uh, things went okay at first, but Charles would file for a divorce only three years later into the marriage in 1916. They would remarry within the same year, apparently. Then one night, Charles beat up Agnes so bad that the police were called and, the Char and Charles had to be placed in jail. Uh, during the trial, I guess they had like a court case, the prosecutor warned Agnes that Charles would most likely kill her given the chance. She amazingly declined to um, prosecute him and filed for a divorce. And part of that deal was Charles was to attend a military hospital to get mental help in uh, California. All seemed fine at this point. Agnes was away from Charles, and her sister actually moved in with her just to kind of keep an eye on her, I'm guessing. Keep her company. Her sister would go home one night thinking she could leave Agnes alone, Agnes alone with Charles being checked into a hospital in California. In addition, a man named Howard Sigsby, who was staying at the home. I, I believe I read that he was just a young guy just living there. and She probably felt comfortable knowing a man was in the house as well to protect her in case something went wrong. Well, something went wrong. There's a slight problem. Charles checked himself out of the hospital and was headed back to Oregon to his ex-wife's house. So, you can guess what's coming up. And apparently this is Charles' story that he told. He came to the house and could hear a man inside. He peered in the bedroom window, saw a man standing in his underwear, which was Howard Sigsby, and saw him and Agnes embrace. Charles would get a running start and dove through the bedroom window, crashing in. Charles claimed that Sigsby, who was only wearing underwear at the time, keep in mind, pulled out a revolver and pointed it at Charles. There was a struggle, and magically, three bullets were discharged, all hitting Agnes perfectly in the head, killing her. Isn't that peculiar? Back to Sigsby, Charles claimed that Sigsby ran to the kitchen, hit Charles with a hatchet, and knocked him dizzy. But Charles doesn't remember much from there, but remembers shooting Sigsby in self-defense and smashing his head in with the hatchet. By the way, over and over, not just one blow, over and over. Charles would try not to commit suicide. Dis um, actually, he would try to commit suicide, apologies. Disconnecting the stove gas line. He survived hum somehow, I don't know how. But um, while he was in the hospital recovering, I guess his war buddies went to bat for him, telling the newspaper how great Charles was and how crazy Agnes was and that she just drove him completely insane. He wasn't himself due to her. The trial came and Charles would tell the most elaborate story possible and claimed he knew nothing about the divorce originally. He would be found guilty at first, but his war bros uh, pleaded for a pardon with the governor at the time and claimed he had more than a few months to live. Something was going on. Wow, look at this little hummingbird coming up to us. Um, so yeah, his war buddies said that, uh, oh, he only has a few months to live and he doesn't, he doesn't need to live his days out in jail. Please release him. So he was released. One year later, Charles was out of jail and a free man. And part of the deal was checking him into a California veteran's hospital. 
strangely enough, Charles would magically be cured, quickly recovering from what deathly illness he had. Charles would live out the last 18 years of his life in Oregon and is buried at Riverview Cemetery. Okay, hope you enjoyed that story about Charles. It was an interesting one I came across in Ken Bilderbeck's book, which I highly recommend. Here it's some good ones. So let's start our little mini tour here, which it'll be a mini, mini tour. There is only 24 people buried here, I believe. If I remember right, that was on Find a Grave. And these two headstones on Find a Grave were upright at one time, but it looks like they were knocked over. And here's Ira Eard. I don't know how to say his name, but he's uh, kind of the OG of the family, the very first one. And then his wife, Deborah, which I think she's actually buried over here. Because it says uh, DP for Deborah Patterson. So I believe that's the true marker where she is. This is IEP. Maybe that's where Ira's buried. Again, apologies. It's it's so loud by the cemetery. And if you park, I man, be very careful. That's pretty much where you have to park, right there, next to the road on the side. You can see how close that car was. So I I actually got out of my passenger door. <laughs> This one, I can't read anything, so I'm just going to leave the camera there and hopefully you guys can read it for yourself if you're interested. It looks like Patterson Puritan to me, but I'll leave it to you guys. It's another Ira, Ira. Look, another Ira on the bottom. <laughs> Alice H on top. We talked about Cora a little bit. This looks to be the latest burial from 1980 another Puritan which I read that the Puritans were a very popular last name back during pioneer times in this area in fact there's a road right next to it named Puritan Road so I think there was something called the Puritan District too and I'm not sure if they're just referring to a specific farm area out here family was really involved with law. I believe the original era he was a judge and I think one of his sons maybe followed his footsteps of uh, working in the law area. And I cannot read that. Charles Witt all by himself over here. that is pretty close to the end <laughs> like I said it's a very very small cemetery and we do have a plate here but no information on that this, like I said earlier when I was talking about private Charles this would be the Watsons headstone here Pretty big memorial, actually. I think it's the biggest in the cemetery. It's in the best condition, too. So, apologies. Very small cemetery, not a whole lot of history, but I hope you enjoyed the little, little micro stories and dug up that story on Charles. 
you have any other recommendations on cemeteries to visit within uh, Oregon or even Washington, feel free to comment below. Hope you liked the video and uh, have a great day. Now, apologies, I forgot to show you Lucinda Puritan. I believe that might be Charles's real mother. There was no date of birth, nothing, nothing on the headstone, nothing on find a grave. So I get the feeling that's her.